All right, so thanks everyone for joining on that Friday evening. So there is a lot of tools to validate your manifest, uh, your community's manifest. I'll try to provide like a, a quick overview of the different levels of uh, validation we can do. Uh, I assume that you all have like a little bit of uh, Kubernetes background. Uh, other than that, I hope that everyone will be able to, to, to learn every, something from a presentation tonight. So about me, thanks for the intro. Uh, so yeah, I'm a Stefan Gisnerical Tenfold. Uh, I moved to Berlin 10 years ago. It's been a while. Uh, it was so cheap at the time. That was the main reason for coming here. Uh, Interested in reliability, security, and performance of distributed systems. So that's pretty much also what I do at Contentful. Uh, listed here also three different projects I've been working on in the last three years. Core DNS Node Cache is a, a node local uh, cache system based on Core DNS. Uh, it's open source, that exists as part of uh, Contentful. Cube Secret Syncer is a, a Kubernetes operator to sync secrets manager secrets to Kubernetes. Uh, and kubeconform is a, a kubeval alternative, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. First, I want to say a quick thank you to Gareth, Gareth Rushgrove, uh, who's been the like a, a, a great figure in uh, manifest testing, uh, has been the author and contributor to a lot of the tools we're going to talk about tonight, kube test, kubeval, conf test, different regal rules and libraries. All of that is relying on different uh, uh, tools that he's been keeping up to date for the many, uh, quite a few years now. Uh, for kubeconform, which has been like a base on kubeval, he's been very supportive and helpful, so uh, a big shout out here. So this is a simple Nginx deployment. I just straight copied from the Kubernetes documentation and we want, let's say we want to deploy that. What we're missing is uh, the associated service, but the community documentation doesn't have a service, so I just did one myself, uh, just uh, from, from what I remember, how it's supposed to look like. Uh, if you look carefully and you're very used to that, you might see that there will be a few mistakes maybe in there. Uh, I'm super pretty proud, but I think it's not perfect. So before deploying that, I want to be sure, is this correct? Can I validate that this is right before actually having a PR, someone review it, deploying it, and realizing way too late that it's actually not correct. So our mission, should you choose to accept it, is to use available and open source tooling to identify all the errors uh, in this manifest. So there are different things we will need to do. We will ensure, ensure, need to ensure the file is a valid YAML. Uh, on top of that, it also needs to be a valid Kubernetes manifest. It will need to conform to your and our best practices, so security compliance and just general best practices. And it also would need to apply without errors. Uh, heads up, the more you go down that list, uh, the more complicated and slow it usually gets. So I'll go pretty quickly across that. It's not the most important, interesting part, I think, uh, but your file needs to be a, a, a valid YAML file. Uh, YQ is an easy validator. Uh, there are different ways. RQ, or Python one-liners, it's just like what it would look like. Here, I try to validate this Nginx service. It reports an error. Uh, another tool that you can use is called YAML lint. It's uh, kind of more in-depth. It will really like detect trailing spaces, uh, inconsistent alignment if you use two spaces in, in some places and three in others, duplicate keys can be useful, it can recursively test folders. So you here it detects the same error that uh, YQ found and also another one uh, with a trailing white space. Uh, I think YAML lint is, is nice, it's powerful and flexible. Uh, most importantly, it integrates well with Vim, with Emacs, uh, but the YAML errors uh, are usually covered in higher level tools that we will see uh, after this. It's not super fast, uh, and the like, most of the errors are co cosmetic. Like you, it's, it's kind of frustrating to have a CI and like realize like have a job fail because there is a trailing white space. So that's a the fixed manifest. There are two errors. Like they were had a semicolon instead of a instead of a colon uh, and a trailing white space. So, however, like again, most of the higher level tools will also validate YAML. Uh, consistent formatting is nice, but failing a white uh, a test. For a white space that can uh, can be frustrating, 
Uh, so the recommendation here is look at the, uh, the linters that you can use with your uh, editor, uh, embed that. It's uh, always better to have something that's consistent and uh, not you know, fail, fail a job later on for uh, a, like a semicolon or a colon that's kind of misplaced. As a more important, more interesting part is uh, Kubernetes manifest conformity. And we'll see what that means in a second. And there are different tools here, uh, kubeval, kubeconform, and kubectl. Uh, so what, what do I mean with conformity? So Kubernetes publishes uh, schemas for the different manifests you're going to use. So there is one big file that's uh, kind of checked in the Kubernetes repository. It's like five megabytes big. And it describes the whole API, like all the manifest uh, uh, that you're going to have uh, the kind of properties you're going to put in there, which ones are required, which ones are optional, uh, what types these fields should be. Uh, mostly you want your manifest to conform to that. For example, if you have like a port that's uh, supposed to be a, an integer, not a string, and some, some, some keys, some properties will be required, some will not. So it's, uh, it's a requirement for you, like for your file to conform to the schema, but it's not sufficient for the manifest to be accepted by the API server. This is super useful when you upgrade Kubernetes. Uh, let's say you have all your manifests, you know they work uh, nice against like Kubernetes 116, and you upgrade say like 118 or 119, and suddenly like the, the version of, a, of, an, of a, a file is not v1 beta 1, but v1 and v1 beta 1 is duplicated. Uh, this will alert you. Uh, was not supported anymore. So it's a, a good validation before upgrading a new version of Kubernetes. So default tool, I think nearly everyone uses is called kubeval. So this is how it looks like. You, you just pass it uh, the list of files you want to validate or a list of folders. Uh, it will tell you which ones are actually valid, uh, which ones are not. In this case, it warns us like uh, that the service uh, I, I, I pass to it is invalid. Uh, kind must be one of the following. So service with a capital S. I didn't have a capital S, so that's an error. Uh, while the, the deployment, which we copied from the Kubernetes documentation, is valid. So it exists with one. That's simple enough. We'll go quickly how it actually works. Uh, so kubeval actually doesn't work directly with uh, the Swagger definition. Uh, the reason behind that is uh, the tooling to work with uh, Swagger slash open API files in Go uh, is bad. There is no good library. It's pretty complex to write one as well. So what uh, Gareth, like the, uh, the author of uh, Kubeval has done, he wrote a tool called open API to JSON schema, which uh, actually will take the Swagger definition, convert that, split it into parts, and it converts that to JSON schemas for which the tooling in Go is, is much better. Uh, so there is a repository called Kubernetes JSON schema. It's mostly this Swagger file uh, split into many different files for every resource type. Uh, and like then by a Kubernetes version. All of that then is published uh, on a website uh, with all the files that kubeval will actually uh, download at runtime. So when you done, when you might, uh, when you validate the service, kubefile will look at this website, Kubernetes JSON schema.dev, try to download the appropriate schema for the service, uh, and try to validate your file. That's what happened in the background. So kubeval is great. It's very widely used. Uh, it's pretty fast. It iterates uh, recursively over folders. Uh, you can validate different versions of, uh, against different versions of Kubernetes. Uh, but there are two gotchas. So first, uh, it says there is no support for custom resources. That what the documentation says. Actually, it's possible. It's a little bit tricky. Uh, and there are a bunch of not uh, so easy to fix bugs. Sometimes, like, warnings will cause, cause like, the, uh, the tool to exist with one, sometimes with zero. Uh, the output is supposedly JSON or tab, but some is, it always contains some kind of uh, junk warnings as well. Uh, so it's, it's not the most easy thing to use. Uh, and there are, these errors are actually pretty hard uh, to fix with Kubeval. It's been quite some time on that, uh, and it requires quite some changes. 
so I'll go back to this no support for custom resources, because uh, welcome to the world of Kubernetes operators. There are more and more Kubernetes operators, uh, Prometheus, Jaeger, uh, Cube Secret Tinker is the one we developed. There are like many, many, like for so many custom resources nowadays. Uh, if you don't validate that, like you, you, you end up with like a, a lot of potential mistakes. Uh, contentful, like what, there was one, uh, we, we did, I, I did one mistake in a, in a manifest and nearly caused an, uh, uh, an incident in the end. And uh, that could have easily been caught early on uh, by like a validation. That's where I got kind of more, okay, how do I get kubevalg to, to, to really uh, validate also custom resources? Uh, TLDR, it's not easy. So I am like, a, it required a lot of, lot and lot of changes. Uh, so what I ended up doing is uh, trying to write like an alternative to kubeval that contained the changes I wanted to see in kubeval. So this new, new tool is called kubeconform. So it's very, very similar to kubeval. It solves uh, all of the issues uh, I had with it. So it has like a, uh, always a clean exit code when it fades or, su fades or succeeds. Uh, it's, it's faster, like it uses multiple Go routines. Uh, it has like a pretty good support for custom resources. So mostly like this is the kubeval kind of how I wanted it to be. Uh, and I'm right now I'm still working with Garus and maybe making this a future version of kubeval, but right now it's still a, a separate project. This is what like a CRD support looks like in kubeconform. Most of the, um, the custom resources and the operators you work with provide actually an open API uh, schema. So I, I wrote a tool to convert the schema to JSON, to a JSON schema. Uh, so like in this case, you can see I download the, uh, uh, the open API schema for a resource called like SageMaker uh, from an operator from AWS. I convert that to JSON. Uh, and then I run kubeconform with this dash schema location, uh, which mostly takes like a, a template to tell it where to find uh, the, the schema for a particular resource. And I try to validate like a training job custom resource and that actually works. So that's how it's supposed to work. You will, you convert all your open API to JSON schema. You put that in a, uh, in a folder somewhere with your library of custom resources schemas and you add that to the, uh, the schema locations, like the, uh, the libraries of schemas that kubeconform will look up into. So kubeconform is very, very close to kubeval. It's kind of uh, as feature parity, it does the same thing. I use the same test suite to validate that it works. Uh, it fixes a lot of the uh, outstanding kubeval bugs. Uh, there are some quite nice performance improvements, like three to four times faster. Uh, at least on a machine, it's quite nice when you run it in a CI or you want to run it locally a few times. And the support for customer resources is quite flexible. You can uh, choose how you want to put them on your disk. You might make some that are uh, specific to a specific version of Kubernetes, etc. So that supposedly works nicely. Uh, cons is like it's mostly a smaller project, smaller community. It's pretty new, so it's not just as better tested. Uh, but again, it's pretty heavily tested. Uh, we've been using this for a while, so it's, for us, it works nicely. Uh, a new a newcomer, what I was uh, surprised to learn, it's not too much advertised. KubeCuttle also does um, client-side validation. So when you run KubeCuttle with apply dash dash validate equals true, and then dash dash dry run equals client, so that's a I think a property from uh, kubectl 118 and up, it will actually try to validate on the client side uh, the manifest. So like it just exits, we will try to just say it's like try to create uh, an exit with zero if it succeeds. Uh, in this case, however, uh, it didn't detect the error that uh, kubeval and kubeconform found. So the capitalization error didn't work. Uh, so I tried again with another file, like I tried to break the deployment. I used, uh, I changed like the port, which was an integer to a string. And in this case, it actually did detect it. Uh, so it, it, it works, I think slightly differently. It has a different validation mechanism. I'm not sure if it actually uses um, this uh, swagger file or something else. Uh, 
Uh, and also it requires a connection, even if it's a client side validation, it requires a connection to the Kubernetes cluster. So the pros is it's a Kubernetes upstream project. Everyone has kubectl installed. It's very fast, uh, but it's, it still requires a connection to the cluster. I'm not sure why, like I open a ticket on that. I think maybe to figure out what version of the cluster it needs to validate against. Uh, I'm not too sure. Uh, and it's unclear what exactly is validated and what the logic is. I would have expected the, uh, uh, the, the service, which was not valid, to be actually uh, detected as non valid. So that's our fixed manifest. You need a capital S. Uh, and learning is you need to use kubeval or kubeconform to validate your manifest. There is a lot of mistakes that we found uh, regularly with that. If you misname a property or you, you put the wrong type, something that's supposed to be a string or an integer, it's much easier to figure this out during UCI before trying to apply that than actually trying to apply it. And maybe it will apply, but not do what you're expected to do. For example, classically, if you have a property, you misname it, maybe it will apply, uh, but you, you will think it does something and it doesn't. KubeCuttle is doing, starting to do the same validation as well. As of 2020, at least as of now, I think it's fully documented. Uh, it's unclear what it does. I would keep an eye on it like over the next years, uh, but right now I would advise to use kubeval or kubeconform. All right, uh, enforcing best practices and compliance. So there are different, um, once your file is a valid manifest, you want to ensure that it conforms to your uh, your best practices, your security requirements, uh, different kind of questions you want to ask. Like, uh, for example, if you want to say all deployments should have resource requests set, or uh, no container should run as privileged, processes in containers should not run as root. Uh, I think there are there is a lot of questions of uh, uh, policies you can put in there. I think all the policies depend on what the company requirements are. Some like if you require very strong security, like there is a lot of things you can test for. Uh, there is a lot more things you can do. Like if you want to ensure like uh, uh, every deployment has namespace set explicitly, for example. ConfTest is uh, also written by our friend Gareth. Uh, it's policy is written in a language called Rego. Uh, it's a language inspired by Datalog, derived from Prolog. It's a declarative language. Uh, they call it simpler and more concise. Uh, supposedly, I think it's pretty different from what most of you could be used to. Uh, for me, it was like it took a little bit of getting used to before actually being proactive with it. Uh, but in the end, it's a really good language to, uh, to test your manifest. For example, all manifests should have a namespace explicitly defined. That's how I would test this with ConfTest. So if I have a, a policy called namespace.rego that I put in my folder policies and I want to test uh, my deployment and my service, I see that both fail because I do not have a namespace explicitly set. Uh, and so this will fail. Uh, in, in my case, for example, I like the, the namespace to always be explicitly defined. Uh, so this is, for example, a rule uh, I would use. That's what it looks like. So that's Rego. Uh, so I ensure like uh, there are some kinds of manifests that do not have uh, uh, a namespace requirements. So I just kind of avoid them. And mostly it says if the metadata, the namespace is not set, then uh, deny with a message, no namespace set. So ConfTest uh, uses Rego, which is quite a powerful language. It has a testing system as well. So like you can test your rules, your policies, uh, that's really, really useful. Uh, it uses the same language used for admission controllers. So that's something I, I won't go too much into, but mostly there is a, a control, an admission controller you can deploy to Kubernetes and use the same rules that you would write for ConfTest to actually deny uh, some resources at deployment. So it's like rather than testing in UCI, you can also uh, deny deployment of some manifest depending on some of the policies you write. Um, so it's the same language, so it's quite useful to have this uh, both in UCI and at Kubernetes level. So the documentation of Rego is excellent, uh, and there's a lot of existing rules. 
So like uh, I linked here like a, a, a lot of rules for Kubernetes, uh, which will go across security, best practices, etc. So community is huge. So you, if you have questions and need help, there is always someone to reply. Uh, the whole cons, the only cons I have here is Rego can be unfamiliar. It's kind of one more thing to pick up. It's pretty unlikely that you like before you start working with it that you know this already. Uh, so it requires like a couple of days at least to uh, kind of read through documentation and pick up. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but like yeah, I think two days is uh, a good time to start to be productive with it. So another tool which is nice is uh, called CubeSec. Uh, this one scores your manifest using a list of built-in rules. For example, I, I, if I run CubeSec scan fixtures and both my Nginx files, it will run a, a list of checks, each of uh, each check giving a score. And at the end, it will tell me, okay, your score is so much. So this manifest is not valid or doesn't comply or it's, uh, the score is lower than no limit and then therefore it complies. Uh, I don't think it's such a great tool. What's actually pretty good is the list, um, is the website around it and the list uh, of checks it actually has. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of tests with a good description every time of why this test is important, what is the, the consequence of this, uh, why you should kind of make sure that your manifest respects those rules. Uh, so I, I would, it's, Definitely a good thing to look at this website, look at the different rules uh, and, and see whether you want to comply to that. Uh, however, most of these rules you can also write uh, in Rego for conf test. So it's, it's kind of a one more tool that you don't necessarily need. Uh, so for example, I've linked here uh, the CubeSec policies that have been rewritten in Rego. So you can use conf test to check for the same kind of policies. My, my personal advice is you probably don't need CubeSec, but the documentation is great. Uh, and the, the policies uh, are some you can just pick and reuse and link to the CubeSec website for all the thoughtful descriptions of uh, all these rules. Honorable mentions, so like I'm going through a few more tools and there are a lot of them. I'm not even listing all of them. One is called CubeScore, it's similar to CubeSec. It will score manifest according to a list of built-in rules. However, it's not extensible. You can't write your own rules, but there is a good documented list of checks. Uh, so that's kind of my same advice is all of this you can do also using conf test, uh, but add your own as well. So look at the list of uh, checks it does, uh, see if you can rewrite them in Rego, and then you, uh, it's a really good starting point. Kubelinter is very similar to kubescore. Uh, it, it reports errors instead of scores. It's also not extensible in, in early stages of de development. So the so both are very, very similar. Uh, my take is I think you, you can, you, you're better off with um, a tool that you can extend and write your own policies for. Last honorable mention, kubetest is also a testing framework with tests written in Skylark, which is a subset of Python. Uh, some people who use Bazel might know, I think it's used there as well. Uh, it was also written by uh, Obilov Gareth, uh, but it's been archived now in favor of ConfTest. That's mostly what I had uh, for the frameworks you can use to test your manifest. So here I just added namespace default. It's not like, it's not an error, it's just like a an example of a policy you can add and requires that the namespace is set explicitly. Uh, yeah. So learnings, I would say conf test and uh, OPI, OPA is a de facto standard for policy-based testing. Uh, I think it's more flexible, uh, testable, uh, and pretty fast as well. So I think, I think it's more interesting than maybe the other solutions. Uh, and why most people are not familiar with Rego, it's not too hard to pick up again, maybe one, two days, and you're, you, you're good enough to start to write your own policies. So I would say this should be part of your CI. I'll push a bit more on conf test for a few more uh, reasons. You can test groups of resources with conf test. Uh, so if you have one, if, if you write all your policies against one file, that might be good enough. Uh, but it's interesting sometimes to ask questions across multiple uh, resources. For example, like a, a classic one is a deployment should specify a number of replicas 
unless there is a matching uh, horizontal product scaling rule for it. Or you want to ensure that a services selector uh, has a matching deployment. So this is the kind of thing where you, you're going to write rules uh, across multiple files and you want to, to ensure, okay, like a, the service should have a deployment or uh, this resource should have this policy, but only these other resources has this other property. This is made possible by a, a flag from Confess, which is called dash dash combine. So rather than operating on a single file, your uh, all your policies will operate on a list of files. Uh, fair warning here is the runtime complexity increases with the number of files that you test at the same time. Uh, so usually I would recommend deploy like one application with all its files in the same folder and you can write like your, uh, your rules against like maybe five or 10 or 15 different resources, uh, but it gets more and more uh, slow as you add more files. So an example here is uh, if I want to say a services selector should have a matching deployment. Uh, so in our example, we have a service and a deployment, and I want to ensure that the service actually points to the deployment we have. Uh, so you can see, we check that the spec, that selector, uh, that match labels, that app in the deployment file matches the spec, that selector, that run in the service file. Uh, if that's not the same, then we get an error that says the service points to a non-existing deployment. So this would be like a rule uh, I would run with conf test. And this actually fails and shows me that uh, the selector I had for my service was incorrect and I need to use Nginx instead of Nginx service. So this is a good example of uh, a test that actually tests two manifests, two different files at the same time. Uh, last but not least, uh, does the manifest apply without errors? So it's again using kubectl. Sorry, I'm, I'm told it's cube control. Uh, so you have two ways of validating files using cube control. Uh, one is what we saw before with dash dash try runs equals client. And in this case, for example, a file actually works. Uh, but if I use a dash dash try run equals server, then you will actually send the file to your Kubernetes API and which will try to apply it in a dry run mode. And in this case, we detect one additional error that we haven't caught so far. It will say the uh, protocol should be TCP, but with a, a written in capital letters. And we wrote TCP in small letters. Uh, so this is something we only could detect by actually running uh, the cube uh, control validation as a dry run against the server. And that's our, our fixed manifest. Protocol should be in uppercase. And I think it's the last error. So that's our final manifest with uh, highlighted all the, the mistakes I made uh, and uh, the comments, the different tools we use to figure them out. Uh, so there are YAML errors. There are some errors we figured out because we added a policy uh, for it with conf test. Uh, some we reused kube control and dry run client and server mode. Uh, and then we had a final conf test across multiple files to detect the error with the selector. So that's my take on this. I think there are many more tools to use. So it's very much an opinionated uh, list, but I would recommend you use a, a good YAML linter integrated with your editor rather than build that new CI. That can be frustrating. Uh, you can use kubeval or kubeconform to ensure your files are valid Kubernetes manifest. This will usually save you time. It always happened that there is some typo uh, or you use uh, a property that you thought would be valid but actually it's not or you want to upgrade Kubernetes and you want to ensure that all your manifests will still be valid and finally use conf test with a library of policies for additional validation best practices and security compliance this is a library of policies that you write as code uh, you can test them as well uh, and you, you cannot build up over time a list of libraries to ensure that all your manifests are compliant with these kind of rules. So errors and manifests are easy to overlook. You should definitely test them. It's easy, it's just pretty set up. Uh, you save time. Kubernetes will not detect all mistakes. Sometimes you will, like I've seen regularly that we used uh, 
properties that did not exist. And actually, we, we expected them to do something, and Kubernetes just accepted the manifest and ignored us and just wasn't doing what we thought it would. Uh, and testing your manifest will ensure, uh, will help you enforce best practices uh, and ensure you are compliant with your security guidelines. All right, I have a QR code here. Uh, it links to a GitHub repository with all the uh, like scripts I've used here, a little bit of documentation, you can check it out. Happy to answer any questions. Hope it was useful. Well, I think uh, Pavel actually asked if the slides will be published because he wanted the links earlier in the talk. I will I will add the link to the to the on the meetup page and if you scan this I will actually upload the uh, upload the PDF or whatever uh, to the GitHub repo as well. So happy to share that. Yeah, and Dominic just asked another question. If you are working with Helm, do you just use Helm template or any other hints there? So there for Helm, there are um, you have um, plugins for for Helm. So you you have. Uh, a plugin, I think, for Kubeval and for uh, ConfTest for Helm. So I would recommend to check that out. And I think do you, uh, Pava would just follow it up as well. Does uh, KubeCon form and ConfTest work with Helm? ConfTest does. So there is an, uh, again a plugin for, for Helm. Oh, it's the same. <laughs> and, and KubeCon form doesn't yet. Actually, I haven't looked at this yet, but uh, if, if there should definitely be a possibility to get it to work as well. Thank <laughs> you.